just to jump into it, you did the game before on Kickstarter as well, right? But mm -hmm. then you didn't have success. Like, how do we see it in in your timeline? Like, what is the timeline of <laughs> Rogue Angels? Well, um, the inception is from 2016-ish somewhere around there. I approached one of my designer friends and I, I said, I, I really want to do a Mass Effect game. Uh, I had finished the trilogy and I was like, why is this not a board game? And I had many other things to do in my life at that point, mm -hmm. but I had an idea that um, I needed to do a, a Mass Effect board game. And at this point, I had already published uh, one science fiction game and we had already expanded in that world and published some books where I had contacted a, an author who uh, who could help me. Because yeah. you, you were kind of really saying, oh, I wanted to make a Mass Effect game because most people were like saying like, oh, it looks a little bit like Mass Effect uh, and with Gloomhaven combined and but that was your mm. purpose so did you took yeah. the offer also from the mass effect people or like or what's no no like i just really wanted to create something that invoked the feelings i had when i played the computer game hmm. And there's a lot of design decisions going into that. And yeah. There's a lot of other things we can uh, unpack. But that was my, my first goal. I, I wanted to create uh, the same feelings I've had uh, playing those games. And I wanted to make them emotionally resonant with other people in a way that in the end could make people cry if it was crafted well enough. If the board game was crafted well enough, then it could get to people, you know, on a deeper level hopefully and i had um, uh, several initial ideas and i threw them back and forth and stuff and it was not until the beginning of the pandemic or somewhere around that time i started to really build it like i built a few loose prototypes and played around with the concepts and the concepts worked but they were not refined enough that it could really become a game yet but then I started crafting it three, four years ago. I just plin printed black and white components. Everything was black and white because I didn't want anything to be convincing enough in itself. It needed to be the story, the mechanics should convince players to keep playing and not arbitrary cool artwork. It had a very positive uh, feedback. And then I started building it in a tabletop simulator because mm -hmm. then I could reach more people and from there on, I kind of got the confidence that I should actually create this game. I could feel that the, the feedback was so positive that I should keep pushing. I was trying the tabletop <coughs> version. Oh, maybe then the rules are all, <laughs> all included, but I was like, oh no. <laughs> so I couldn't cheat check <laughs> on a tabletop uh, what the rules were. Um, I mean, you did a really good job, but it was very challenging to start this game because it has so many different rules. There's a lot of things that a computer game can hide from you, which you cannot hide when it's a board game, right? Everything needs to be explained and everything needs to be understood for people to become the engine themselves, right? And, and play the game. Well, you know it, now the viewers know it, mm -hmm. that I contacted you to just ask one specific question with the behavior cards. You have mm. like behavior cards, the first with the initiative and then the second one. And then I was like, yeah, but if there are four enemies, mm. then do they all like swarm to me? I have not experienced that before when you were saying your solution, you said like, no, only one and two will attack you and three and four mm. seems to idle. And, and that was something that was a very interesting choice of mechanic because that is mm. uncommon in games and yeah. also in a lot of things. So where, how did you came up with that? Oh, it, it had many iterations. I remember I had a wheel where I went around <laughs> and players were in between and enemies and whatnot, right? And there are the classic where everyone at the table have a turn and then the enemies go, and then everyone has a turn. But what I found out is that it's more engaging on an individual level if the enemies move in between players' turn, because that means the solution that you are kind of trying to put out as a player is a bit different than my solution will be because the things have changed on the map when it, yeah. it, it becomes yeah. my turn. I, I was not talking about that element because I think hmm. it's a very strong element. I was more talking about like uh, one number one, two, three, and yeah. four because that was <laughs> very unnatural. Still, I'm very yeah, confused yeah. about it. That was it's uh, it's the. Um, Conclusion to the fact that if you had all enemies activate in between every player's turn, the players would die very fast. Bam. Um, <laughs> um, 
players might think that they can take advantage of idle enemies, but the thing is, it's the active enemies that pose a threat, and therefore you have to deal with them. And because you have to deal with them, then when you start eliminating them, the other enemies come into play, because now it's suddenly their initiative, because you've killed one and two, then three and four goes. It's self-fulfilling that you have to deal with the real problems at hand, and you cannot skip over and just kill the idle enemies because that's not really what you have time for yeah so. okay fair enough why did you make a choice to just say in the menu like uh there are so many enemies and when the enemy is like at this this number or whatsoever mm -hmm. a new one spawns because you, they're still on the board you, f mm. you focus also on three and four yeah it's a fine balance between action and administration the administration that you can always have in a computer game is that you can pack all those things away. But if players have to sit and, for example, count enemies to make sure, oh, now I have to spawn a new enemy, or they have to make sure that, oh, it happens in between here, that's administration. And the more administration you put on players, the less action they will get. It to be as accessible in terms of action as possible. And that means there are a few things that has to be handled differently than most of these types of games would do for it to kind of achieve that. But once people get used to that torque in the system, then it's, you know, it's yeah, second Yeah, yeah. it was them. more yeah. like, I was like, whoa, this is yeah, yeah. very different from anything else I ever played. And I also played a lot yeah. of board games. Another element of your game, which m makes it quite special, I think. I mean, there are some games that are doing wounds or whatsoever, but you, yeah, well, you have like uh, an underneath like your ability cards, your waiting rounds basically, but then mm. you, you just place the wounds also on those places. That was very interesting. At the, at the beginning, I also thought that when you just do a short rest that also the wound uh, moved, but I, I was not very sure because later in the, in the booklet, it said like something else that it, it stays only with healing. Uh, because it was very natural that it moves every, well, every short rest. Every, everything, yeah. It actually depends a little bit on character, but uh, usually the cooldown track is the, the way for you to manipulate your actions and your also your wounds. So the more you stay out of combat, the more you heal because the cards rest off and you can actually rest them to the side oh, to still, also speed the, up the process. Oh, so the wounds, I, so I was doing it right at the first part, but then I read something and then it seemed that I was not doing it right. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, you were doing <laughs> it right then, yeah. But you can okay. also heal them. You can also heal them to speed up that process. So, and you can heal others, but that requires you to have characters who have heal cards. Not everyone has that. The interaction with objects, that is only yeah. when something is conscious, right? Like in conscious. Yeah, exactly. That's to protect players from themselves. Let's say you play a game and you only choose to play with damage dealing heroes. So you don't have any healers. And that's fine, but mm -hmm. that means you can only heal yourself or heal others if they go down, like if they become unconscious, then you can heal them. So you can always get out of a situation, but there are characters who can do it more economically feasible in terms of energy spent or action spent, right? Everyone can do everything. It's just the level of effectiveness that is affected, right? Yeah, because but then I had like with the healing, if you throw like plus three, that means that the healing goes three times, right? Or not? Or is that mm -hmm. just... Yeah, then you can take, take, then you can remove uh, three wounds on, on somebody's track. For example. Oh, even take it out because I thought they yeah. move free place. No, no, yeah. no. Oh, okay. See, I was playing hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the system is f so simple in its basic mechanics, means that it works even if you misinterpret a few rules. It doesn't, mm. you know, bog down and you cannot move any further in the game. I'm very happy with that fact because when it comes to dungeon crawlers, they are inherently complex. And therefore, it's better the more room you can make for mistakes. Yeah. And players can still progress. Then they might figure out later on, ah, oh, okay, I played this wrong. No, okay, but things worked. So, you know, yeah, all good. The worst thing is if players ever come to a hold and they cannot advance, and it doesn't matter then if it's your fault or the player's fault. If they cannot advance, then it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Also, how it connects very with legacy games because you unlock a lot of stuff because you say, okay, I wanted to make a game of Mass Effect, but 
Have you played a lot of lo like those legacy games? Did you get that inspiration or was it more like it came in that flow just because you were making such a game? For a game designer, I have not played many board games. I must admit, I I played a lot more the last two years. I've played a lot more games, but that's due to my friends. I've gotten a lot of new friends who have invited me into board game uh, get togethers. But before that, I hadn't played a lot of board games. Okay. Uh, so my my mechanics and the way I approached many of the things are video game inspired primarily because I've played a lot more video games. So that that's where most of my inspiration comes from. Well, that's interesting. And maybe that's also why some things from board games feel natural. I was like, but it's doing a little bit different. <laughs> you worked on this idea, like uh, maybe you already said it, but like how long have you worked on uh, the board game and you're still working on it? Actively, I've been working on this for the last three to four years, okay. four years time. The majority of all the work that has been done has been done within the last four years. The inception is a long time ago and then you you kind of take an evening out sometimes where you've been sitting and cutting and pasting and you know doing some tests and run some scenarios in your head and whatnot the majority has been within the four, uh, last four years where there's been a lot of evenings used on both writing testing putting images together run in design excel all these things together so and if i hear this correct you were doing this on a side hustle at the start mm. or not yeah. But what did you do next to it? I've been in the army for eight years and uh, then I left the army and I started studying again and then I was done with that. Then I did consultants work with my own company and primarily leadership consultant because of the, the experience from the army. And, and now I am, you know, 80% on my own in, in the board gaming thing and doing something on the side when when I need okay. to. Okay. And do you think that your army experience also influenced the choices that you made into how you approach your work ethics, your game design and so on? Yeah, a lot, a lot. In terms of what happens outside my, my work ethics and in my motivation and, and my discipline on this area is, is probably what have affected me the most. I've learned to, to be very disciplined and strict uh, in how I approach my, my work in general which means that I free my mind a lot for the heavy creative sessions I need and make sure I do all the work we need to do just to get through or the administrative work and stuff. So I'm very disciplined about these things uh, to make sure they don't take up valuable space for all the creative things that needs to happen too. Is it more that you are doing your hardest task, task first or is it more that you are doing your mundane task first or like what, mm. is, what is your way? Definitely start with the lowest, easiest tasks first and ramp. So you should always build a momentum because the risk is if you do not get the very difficult task done then you end up ruining everything else and your mood and your feelings towards all the mundane tasks suddenly becomes something that is unbearably hard to get through but that's your mind playing tricks on you right it's always about ramping when it comes to tasks and, and just for today I have a, a little list of uh, things I, I need to do and I like for example when I have to write for the story of my game which is like you can say I'm just writing a page but it's like being an author suddenly right so you have to be in the right uh, mode and stuff like that so first I get my emails out of the way then I make sure that I have checked everything else I need to check and then I go in and then I also divide all the larger work into uh, minor pieces right so you can never have a, a task that is more than you know 20 half an hour long Otherwise, you should divide it because... Yeah, 20 it's... hours sounds... <laughs> no, not 20, uh, 20 minutes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, 20 <laughs> hours. That's that's insane. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I uh, don't 20, know what they do with the army, uh... right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 20 <laughs> hours. <laughs> so a little so... bit uh, Pomodoro technique, basically, because that's 25 yeah, yeah. minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. And then five minutes uh, break and, and so on. You, you, could, you could say that. I don't use it actively, but I tried and... Uh, it's it's a it's a fine technique. Yeah, interesting how someone who has 
like being formed with discipline, what their advice is on it. Some people say do first your task that you feel the most oh, tension, and but you say like no, do the first things, and then you just give yourself energy. So that's interesting. And then of course we are talking about how different it is to to make a board game. Like on your perspective, what the difference is between a board game and like a digital game or mm, uh, some yeah. other art. Just, uh, I worked on some digital gaming and, and I've done some game jams as well. I mean, board games are to some extent more accessible because you, you don't need the programming. So there is a part you can leave out. But with it being more accessible, you also have a lot more uh, people who can enter into the market, right? Everything that you can write as a, as a pro, you can also get some kind of con to that side, right? It's double-edged sword, uh, everything in terms of video game versus board game. The interesting part is, of course, that the cost on creating a, a board game starts low and then increases, whereas a video game starts high and then it decreases because it doesn't matter how many copies you ship out. With a video game or with all the digital production, which also goes for a board game, the digital production part of a board game, everything in there you can in the end learn by yourself like you you can learn to draw you can learn to program you can learn to do all those things if you want to like it's all about your your quality of time versus money and all that stuff right mm -hmm. the problem is of course with a board game that there is this manufacturing part that you cannot do by yourself no matter how you frame it right so if you want to go that way you also need the funding in some form of or another which would be kickstarter or game found or something like that you but that, you need that <clears throat> you call that funding ah, okay because with funding you also have sometimes that the government is like supporting you or like giving you yeah. funding but okay it's the way of yeah. how you sell it that's what you call the yeah. funding okay yeah that's, so that's... you need the funding before you can produce it and actually sell it finally right so yeah. yeah was it immediately i want to do kickstarter or uh, did you try out different techniques um i've been familiar with kickstarter since 2010 or something like right after they launched and uh, i've been following it and i had my first game on kickstarter in 2013 so i it's been around for me for a long time and it was clear from the very get-go that it would be a game changer in terms of how to get funding because nobody wants to owe anything to the bank because no matter how you put it the bank is not a place of passion or a place of understanding or or a place of compassion it's it's easy to see why why people would prefer uh, crowdfunding also for the marketing benefits and all the other benefits especially for the funding instead of having to go and talk to a bank and say well i need a hundred thousand for this production so on and so forth yeah so. yeah and like a kickstarter is like taking off 30 percent of, of the profit i hear right uh, they take uh, they take five percent and then there's oh. a five percent administration oh. um, all that kind of thing so you end up with a currency conversion if such a thing has to happen you would end up with 10 to 12 percent less than what you have oh, okay uh, yeah yeah, and, uh, what is it? Steam takes 30%, right? If it's a video game, they take 30% of the cut. Oh, and that's maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> the coloration. And what do you hmm. think? Like, if you if there are, is, is now watching someone who is aspired to uh, make their own board game and put it on Kickstarter, what do you think is very important to succeed on Kickstarter? Because you had like a project that didn't succeed, right? And you experienced a project that succeeded on Kickstarter. Yeah, I've had, yeah, maybe now I had a project that didn't succeed then a project that succeeded then the project itself the production took a long time overdue like with it, it came out four years after it was uh, you know done on Kickstarter then I had a project that succeeded and so on and then now one that didn't succeed Rogue Angels and then it succeeded the second time around there's a lot of lot of things that goes into that in those outcomes if you are sitting with plan of doing this yourself you have to first come to an understanding of how much you want this to happen and what you want to put into that project and into that dream because all the things that you cannot do you will have to get somebody to do for you and that requires money. And then it's all about, do you want to learn that skill yourself? Is, is it more fun for you to sit in an office uh, somewhere and earn money and then pay somebody to draw? Or do you want to learn to draw 
um, you know, all those things like time and money, how, how are those things, like how important are they to you? What do you have to spare? And how much do you really need to get it out there? Because the, you can also make games just for yourself and for your friends, and you can also make them free to play somewhere, uh, either by doing a mod on Tabletop Simulator or by creating a, a print and play game that is sold on, on just an online store. And so there are many other options. You, you have to figure out what your time is worth and, and how much of a dream it is for you to, to proceed. But like, okay, for Kickstarter, if you would do another one, like just if someone said like, no, you need to do a new Kickstarter project, like how would you start? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, first of all, uh, the launch date could not be closer than a year from the decision you're making. I want to do it as a Kickstarter. Okay, then you can start that Kickstarter or launch that Kickstarter in a year and not before that. It's not possible in, in, in this day and age because there is so much competitiveness on, on both Kickstarter and the market in general. I, I mean, between one and 2,000 board games are, are published every year, right? So you, you have to get into a market. On Kickstarter, there's always like uh, two to 300 live games, right? Um, just projects that is that is running uh, at the moment so you need to tell the world about what you want to do and you need to sell it to a lot of people way before you actually do the kickstarter you have to think of the kickstarter as the end of your crowdfunding the kickstarter is not the beginning it's not the middle it's the end of your crowdfunding campaign so that's where you launch that's when you know you can get the money you need and yeah, there's a lot of work going into that. So do I hear that you kind of already built up a kind of a community around like in your crowd, basically? Like, mm. How how was your, well, your, <laughs> your way of marketing? It has changed a lot over the years. So since I, I started uh, uh, over 10 years ago and at, back then you could have a cool idea and you could have half done prototype and there's a lot of things that went down in that uh, in that time where um, many things like back from the days when you could crowdfund a uh, potato salad there was like a project of that you can look up but now it's filled with professional game publishers who know exactly what they do they know exactly who to contact they know you know their prototypes almost like finished products and Everything is like focused on the marketing aspect of crowdfunding. So you need to build that community. And I had a community, not a big one, but I had a community from my previous game and I could build upon that because Rogue Angels is set in the same sci-fi experience as my previous game, Burning Suns. So therefore there is an overlap. And how did you start that community or how did you keep them? It's about being vocal and say, well, I have a game poster pictures about like i have a prototype uh, and it, it runs like this and that and my aspiration is that it should look like this start talking about it and get people to comment on it get people to actually give you feedback because people who give feedback are more invested in your final product it has to be built from the ground up where you just start talking to people that's okay. one of the greatest uh, gifts you can have as a game designer is to be able to speak to people. Something that's very challenging for someone who just likes to make their passion project like behind curtains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. That, that's okay. how the world is. And did you use special like digital platforms or what, is it like what I hear like, oh, I just talk with people. You're just going to mm -hmm. on the street and say, hey, or uh, yeah. like, how did you approach it? You know, friends are always a place to start, but you, you have to get involved in, in groups on Facebook or groups and Discord where you start talking to people because you quickly realize that you, you can only have so many friends around you in the physical space that, you know, not everyone will like board games. And therefore you need those people who are sitting somewhere in a, t a time zone, 12 hours difference from you, but they just really saw what you're trying to do and, and they enjoy the the process, right? You, you have to, to get into those kind of groups and chats and there are plenty of them now. Like that's the easier part of, of uh, being a game designer today is that there are so many resources and so many places to go, just to talk to people. Of course, uh, the challenge is that everyone else is also doing a game and you have to kind of stand 
out and stand above that. And how did you f think that you stand out? Yeah, and this goes for everything I've said and what every other creator have said is that there's a huge survivorship bias in us. We do not look back on our previous achievements and failures and judge them in a proper light because we cannot fathom what actually went into the process that turned it around or made the outcome positive or negative. So therefore, everything I say, you have to understand that that can never be applied one to one because I'm me and you're you. So therefore, there's a big difference. But sometimes it's just our luck that is different. That's why some people get hit in a wall, right? By fleeing bullets somewhere. But, you know, everyone wants to get to cover and everyone can get to cover but sometimes somebody gets hit anyways right so i i think that's a, that's a good good way to say like we just rolled some D, &D dice at the start <laughs> <laughs> you also have your luck uh, based on uh, on what happens hmm. in life um the survivor bias is uh it's a real thing, but I think it is interesting mm. to learn from the stories from the survivors because I think mm. we can learn from yeah. from success. Your game is still in, in process, right? Did you already change a lot? Like how how is that average of changes? Yeah. I haven't changed anything mechanically. I, I love it the way it is mechanically and mm -hmm. people seem to love it. So the only thing is I'm building on the story. And in that context, I am expanding upon what the mechanics can contain. So I'm using some of the elements in different ways. So the hacking mechanic that you have tried when you're mm -hmm. opening the doors and stuff like that. I'm using that for other elements now also. So if you interrogate somebody, then you might also use this back building. And mm -hmm. sometimes you might put something back in the bag or take it out. And exploration elements where I'm using these uh, tokens and placing them on the map to do different things later on. I'm expanding upon what the mechanics can deliver. I don't want to put more mechanics into the game because now players have a frame, a box to play in, and mm -hmm. that's where I have to provide the experience and make sure that the people are still comfortable with what they can do, mm -hmm. but just sometimes with a twist. Do you also uh, <clears throat> adding more cards or is that like, okay, no, this is this is more another element that I'm not going to touch? I planned how many cards I wanted to add. I'm looking at everything in terms of like, you have a campaign, you have a campaign, people have to go through different choices and all that stuff. And then I'm looking at when does it make sense to introduce new cards or new elements and trying to always sprinkle things in mm -hmm. so that it's kept fresh but without giving people an abundance of things all the time because more is not more so you have to be careful and make sure that you always keep it fresh fresh is not just getting a new gun that can shoot two instead of one like fresh has to be a bit more it has to be a bit different so now you have a gun that can shoot in a different way, or maybe it has an area of effect, or maybe it can pull you in like a grappling hook or something, right? So you have to expand in realms of usability instead of just expanding in stats. It's not a looter, it's a narrative exploration and in choices. I, I really like that uh, <laughs> approach because that's the danger of adding cards. And also if you say story-wise, if at a certain moment, if all the missions are similar, then mm. it doesn't add up anymore. When are you going to ship it? Uh, hopefully in uh, November, December this year. I want to be done with the majority of all the digital production in May, June, and then initiate the manufacturing and then be done with the digital stuff around August and have everything else wrap up around that. And do we then find your game most likely in some board game stores or like... There are some retailers who have pledged for the mm -hmm. campaign and therefore they will also get the copies uh, together with backers and so on. And then there will be some online uh, stores and, and people can probably buy some from my online store. I'm not sure of how I will implement that or if i will just lay it out to others to do that it's it's not the part that interests me per se like mm -hmm. i just want to make sure that backers get their games and then every retailer who in some way buy the games and, and sell them right but it will not be in broad distribution for the first print run that's not possible so that would require like a completely different types of funding because the first print run 
has all the upfront cost of uh, yeah, all exactly. the production. I'm, I'm expecting to print around 3,000 copies of the game. And that's just not enough for a real distribution. You would have to go into 10 or 20,000 to have something sensible. But then with the manufacturer, it, there is... <clears throat> some saying manufacturer like the more you print or get that the the cheaper the costs become mm. because before you said like uh well it's getting like mm. it's cheap and then it's expensive expensive but i thought personally that at a certain moment it's getting cheaper again when you have more more yeah the unit price can decline mm -hmm. and it can decline to a certain level and then of course it flats out mm -hmm. for the unit price to start declining you need to order a significant amount more which means that your overall cost still ramps up because you will have instances where you have the best unit price for the maximum amount of units you can get but then you get to a lower unit price but in order to get there you need to order 500 or 1000 copies more which means it takes a jump right so it's it's not an even curve <laughs> okay well your game will be out in november december and do you already have a second plan what to continue with or what to do next i have ideas but i there's so much to do on on this game that i don't want to fantasize about that right now because there's still so much to complete i i don't want to put out anything before i know what people really loved about the game so once it goes out there, people will hopefully start telling me what they enjoy and what they didn't enjoy about mm -hmm. the game. So doing an expansion now or having expansion ideas is kind of telling the customers that I know exactly what they want. And how would I know that? And again, you can just do more, but more is not more like yeah. you. When you've done a story and it has an arc and it has an ending, you also need to be satisfied with that ending. And then expansions, yeah, sure. Or a, a second game that took the story further, sure, that's a possibility. But I, I really want to, to get to that ending first, have people play it, and then hopefully there will be a second print because a lot of other people will be inspired to try it out. We'll see wh where it goes from there. I didn't notch on DLC, DLC or like expansion, but just more like, oh, maybe have other board game ideas. But if I hear you correctly, you're really in love with your game mechanics and idea <laughs> that you're like, ah, oh, I mean, I can't imagine that I would not continue with something like this that's what i what it kind of hear uh... and i understand and and i've i've toyed around with other games i think it would be nice to some way uh, after rogue angels do just a simple game mm -hmm. <laughs> like something i could put out within a year would be cool but yeah i, I really still enjoy working on it uh, if a game can stay fresh and engaging for four years in, in in my development cycle i'm just happy and enjoying that and do you have at this moment a kind of a team or like freelancers uh, yeah i i do have a handful of freelancers uh, one doing 3d model one doing artwork for characters one doing artwork for story mm -hmm. uh, characters uh, and one doing artwork for the maps so there are different people who um, who i've commissioned to do uh, different elements and i'm luckily i'm well versed in photoshop and also i can do some 3d so i understand the concepts i understand everything and so if they just leave me enough handles i can you know tweak yeah. and twist the things myself mm -hmm. which is very nice to provide final touch or to just mm -hmm. fix errors that I, I don't have to suddenly sit and write emails in the middle of the night because there's something something right and martin and lisa who are like co-writing they are writing the character stories Mm -hmm. So we have these individual character stories for these uh, 16 characters. It has to follow along the, the main arc. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, back and forth between how should these characters interact with the world and what should they do and what's their big uh, challenge and legacy. And how did you decide who is helping you or where did you find those people? And that goes a bit back to the talking point, you know, like making mm -hmm. sure that you talk to people. Uh, Lisa is the one who's been writing the books, uh, the Burning Suns books. So she's very into the universe, loves Mass Effect and loves science fiction in general and 
all that stuff. Uh, so, so we had a lot of uh, sparring back and forth on what should uh, happen and, and develop. Mm -hmm. She's also native speaking <laughs> in terms of English, <laughs> so that's that's good uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that the, my English uh, can be refined. It's just good sparring to have. I want to do this and this mission and stuff like that. And then he's like, yeah, okay. Then you could think of maybe they should roll some dice for some initiative here, or maybe they should do this. And and getting people on board is very much being loud about like what your vision. Is. What is yeah. your vision? Well, grand vision is that my game will be viewed as I, I have no delusion of grandeur in terms of being the Mass Effect of board games and like like I mean Mass Effect was huge for computer games so at mm -hmm. least it, it, from my perspective but those people who invest in the game should get that feeling should sit back afterwards and be like. I will not forget my playthrough of this game and I can remember those times when we did this and we were betrayed by that person and we saved these and uh, we came too late for this and whatnot. All these things, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want people to be able to tell me their story through the game in a vivid way and, and have a fond memory of that. Yeah, I think we covered a lot. Um, would you have some things that you were like, yeah, but I have not shared this or that, or that you were like, <laughs> uh, please give me give me the space to share this, uh, this knowledge. <laughs> oh, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, there's so much to learn from doing all this. What I would like people to to take with them if they want to do their own thing, always be very careful with how you listen to success stories and always be very thoughtful of how you implement other people's thoughts and ideas into your own daily life. And if you really want to do it, one of the things you must have is discipline. Yeah. You, you cannot get around discipline. You turn it into a habit of what you do. There is the saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast which is like a leadership thing when you have a culture in a company it will always ruin or em put emphasis on your strategy depending on how good your culture is and you know how adapted it is to where you want to go but the same can be said about humans how good are your habits because your habits will always win over your goals so create healthy and productive habits for whatever goal is. I guess because I agree with this, this view. So, but I think it's really nice uh, that you phrase it in this way. Uh, so, okay. So that was kind of the less advice question, but I also <laughs> was wondering if you could maybe show us a bit of how the game looks before or like if you have some because i see in your room a lot of yeah. stuff like do you have something <laughs> that you want to show i have i have so much going on right now and i'm, I'm handing out different uh things i i just sent like 23 kilos of uh, board game components i have lying around to a german gymnasium for some game week and i'm sending a lot of things out to others so i've tried to donate as much of Whatever I'm not using, it just mm -hmm. needs to get into hands of others. And I have a lot of other components, you know, as a game designer, you buy a lot of components from different things. Maybe I should use these. Maybe I should have 800 red cubes for something. You never know. And then <laughs> <laughs> you end up, yeah, maybe I should sell them now. I haven't used them for several years. Most of it is documented, you know, digitally because I don't have room for all the iterations I've done. I mean, I'm still super proud of the box I did for the prototype, right? It just came out so slick and so nice. Like, um, I think it sells the game very well, mm. um, but that's not how it started out. I, I don't even have all the components anymore for the original because, you know, as, as time goes on, you just have to get rid of the old and then iterate your way uh, through and, and upgrade your things, right? So it's a... Uh, it's, it's a long process. process. Yeah, it it's is, an ongoing yeah. process. Nice. Oh, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> thank you for so much wisdom uh, with, with us all. So uh, thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for your sharing.